For 50 years, one man has brought you the plain truth and let the chips fall where they may. And now, Garner Ted Armstrong. Is your religion any good if you understand it? Do you know anything about God? If you wanted to find out about God, where would you go? Would you go to someone else that can tell you about God? Would you just come up with fanciful ideas in your own mind? Would you think about the common expressions, the man upstairs, or the good Lord, or the great someone and the great somewhere? Or would you go to the source? For example, if I wanted to find out about Thomas Jefferson, what would I do? Go to Charlottesville, Virginia, stand outside of Monticello at the Iron Gate, and go oom, oom, and stand out there. There's Monticello. I'd just stand there and light a bunch of candles. Or I'd do a few laps around some beads, and I'd find out all about Thomas Jefferson. Well, I could find out about Thomas Jefferson by going to the library, going to the encyclopedias, or better yet, going to the internet, and actually getting all the information about him from the library. I can find out about Monticello. I can find out about what the man wrote. I can find out about what he thought and said. I can read what others said about him. And I can find out what he said about himself. And I could come to know all there is available in history about Thomas Jefferson. If you want to find out about God, the Bible, the Word of God, purporting to be inspired by God, God Himself who spoke to the prophets of old, who as it were took dictation from Him, and Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came and said, I have come to reveal the Father. The Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. He has given me what I should say and what I should speak. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So here you have the Bible telling you that there is a great God, part of divine Elohim, who is a father of a son. The son is on the earth, the father is up in heaven. Two of them. You read in the first chapter of the book of Genesis in the creation hymn, as it's called sometimes, where God, that is Elohim, which means more than one, said, let us make man in our image. In the image of God made he them, male and female made he them. And you find a great deal out about God in the first few chapters of the Bible. Genesis merely means beginning. You find out a great deal more in reading the writings of the faithful scribes who took it down at dictation from Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who remembered exactly by the power of the Holy Spirit what he said, who put it all down. My question is, why should religion be spooky? Why should it be an unfathomable, vague, dark mystery? Why do you kind of hint at God by lighting candles, reciting chants, doing laps around beads, bowing and scraping, wanting, wearing funny garb. If you see someone in a, in a kind of a weird costume with white down here, the collar around backwards, big old chain, maybe a cross dangling, you say, that's a religious guy. You can see people that you know are religious by the, wear, the, the dresses and the clothing that they wear. And you can see sometimes people by the the expressions on their faces. People can get a kind of a holier than thou. Also, when people go around like this, you know, making, I guess, what is that, a rooftop or a steeple out of their hand? A lot of guys sit around and do this when they're being interviewed, and I think a psychiatrist can tell you there's something there, but others make steeples out of there, go like this to pray. I don't know if God, it says God is not worshiped with human hands. I'm not sure that the instant they do this, something goes on in heaven like a light click. Oh, there he is. Look, he's got a steeple. Pay attention to this guy. We know that sign. We rec Well, I want to tell you about something I have for you. First of all, you probably can detect I don't believe in all that stuff. I don't believe making steeples out of your hands, standing on one foot, tweaking your ear, wringing your nose, funny hairdos, uh, sideburns to hear, beards or the lack of them, shaving your head or having a, a great big huge bouffant. I don't think God pays any attention to any of that stuff. So I have something for you. Is God a mystery? And also a tape, must you believe in the Trinity to be saved? Do you know that many millions of people in the mainstream Protestant fundamentalist denomination believe that God is some kind of a mysterious hypostasis a kind of a three-in-one triumvirate, not an individual Father in heaven, Son of God, Jesus Christ on the earth, who is now right back up in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, as the Bible says, 
and the Holy Spirit being the life-giving mind and power of God, the nature and the character of God that he can actually miraculously put inside the mind of a human being. They do not believe in and accept God as a family of divine beings, which God himself says he is. No, they believe in a hypostasis, a mystery. The question that I ask and I answer in that stand-up sermon before a live audience, must you accept, must you believe in the Trinity in order to be saved? If so, it flies directly in the face of what I did about a week ago where I showed you a little brochure a man wrote that said, what must I do to be saved? Nothing. It says, well, you sure must do something. You've got to believe in this. Well, that's contradictory. And I know the man who wrote the brochure believed in the Trinity, by the way. So it is 903-561-7070 for your free booklet and the free tape, and you will be amazed when you hear all of that, when you look into it. And I urge you, don't believe me, believe your own Bible. Look it up, prove it to yourself. And by the way, check into the website gtaea.org. I'm putting up fairly rapidly now word from, a message from me about goings on in the world, especially in the light of biblical prophecy, as I did prior to the Israeli elections and following the Israeli elections about what's happening in the Middle East and about a lot of other things that are going on, including the Bush initiative, which he has talked about now revamping, which will be like our ballistic missile defense about all the problems going on in Europe, about the possible fracture between the United States and Britain against Europe when NATO collapses and about the creation of a new European army, things and commentary along this line you will see there as well as dozens of booklets, brochures and articles, a lot of my television programs, stand-up sermons, even our statement of beliefs, constitution and bylaws, links to everywhere, including breaking world news. G-T-A-E-A -E stands for Garner Ted Armstrong Evangelistic Association, gtaea.org. Visit that website along with approximately 900 to 1,000 other people every day and over a half million who have looked into it already since we started it, and you'll be amazed at what is there. Now, I ask, why would you want to go stand outside Monticello and go oom and light candles to find out about Thomas Jefferson? Wouldn't make any sense. A tourist guide comes by and says, what are you doing? I'm trying to find out about Thomas Jefferson. Well, I would say the same thing to somebody who is seeking for God and goes to some kind of a formal ceremony and watches all the goings on, man wearing a dress, maybe tinkling a bell, waving a feather, sprinkling salt, uh, sprinkling water, having a mace and shaking it at people, uh, putting a wafer on your tongue, whatever, bowing, standing, bowing, standing, uh, kneeling, you know, all of this, ritual, in other words, ceremony, in other words, I don't, I'm not sure that God looks down when somebody forms a steeple out of their hands and says, we've got to pay attention to that guy, that that immediately lights up in heaven, an alert signal, and God says, oh, there's somebody religious doing something religious, let's look at them. I don't think God is worshiped with human hands. Now, here in front of me is a Bible. The Bible is and purports to be the Word of God. It purports to be not only direct Word of God as spoken to the prophets and the sages and patriarchs of old, it purports to be in Jesus Christ's own statements. You read them in a red letter Bible in red letters so that you know automatically when you glance at the page that this is supposed to be a first person quotation from the Son of God Himself. I want to tell you about a church organization without mentioning them that for dozens of years, for decades, waded through the Bible, tens of thousands of them, proved painstakingly because they were asked to do so by the leadership, which included myself, of that organization, said for decades, don't believe me, believe the Bible. You can prove it to yourself. They found out that God is a divine family of persons, father and son and that God is begetting children on this earth. That the reason these familial terms are used in the Bible is because the family of God is like the model for the human physical prototype, and that the building blocks of any civilization and society are in fact the family. That male and female is found throughout creation. Whales or even lichens, I mean it is found throughout creation all the mammalia of the earth, the flora, the fauna, and so on, male and female, not three. It isn't a triumvirate. There aren't three involved in the reproduction process. There are only two. 
They knew this. They proved it. They looked up all the scriptures, including one I want to read to you in a minute. They understood it. They took notes. I mean, they went through the Bible backwards and forwards. Funny thing happened. The leadership decided they were going to change the doctrines. So they changed them. There was no groundswell of opinion here. There was no cadre somewhere that decided, I think we're wrong about that. Let's go to a conference. Let's have a conclave. I'll take that to my pastor. Then three and five and ten pastors got involved. Then some kind of an area or district superintendent got involved. And then they went out to the headquarters and they talked to the head honcho and they said, we got a problem here. A lot of the people beginning to believe in this hypostasis that didn't happen. Didn't happen. But from on high, it was decided unilaterally by one man Maybe he had two or three or four other people got involved, who knows, advisors. And it's like people will be asking one another, well, what do we believe today? <laughs> what do I believe? It's like somebody saying, I am a dunce. I am a dunderhead. I am really a stupid person. I have given up my personal sovereignty. I have no more decision-making capacity of my own. I am utterly without character. And so I say to my minister, what am I supposed to believe? What does our church believe today? Tell me what I believe. Is that the way it works? Not for me, it doesn't. And for any really thinking person, it shouldn't work that way either. What you believe ought to be the sum total and the result of all of your life's experiences, of all of your own initiative, of all of your own study, of all of your own research and what you have proved and demonstrated to yourself, and then you have formed a body of belief. Let me show you a scripture, right? For example, as I turn to Hebrews, the first chapter, and read a little bit of this, it was stated by some of these people, you can never refer to God as a person. God is not a person. Oh, well, I think I'll take what the Bible says instead of what some so-called Holy Joe or Sky Pilot says about what he thinks God says. So I will turn to the Word of God, the epistle of Paul, the apostle of the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1. God, that's theos in the Greek, which is the exact same synonym from the Hebrew Elohim, and it is a plural word, which is why it has an S ending, not theo, but theos, like Elohim, the I am is more than one, two. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things. God spoke to us by His Son. Son? What's that mean? It means a father has a son. There's nothing technical there. The average seventh grader can understand it. By whom also He made the worlds. If you look at the first chapter of the book of John, it says that without Him was not anything made that was made and that the one we know of as Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the creating agent who gave the divine command by divine fiat, let the dry land appear. Let the waters bring forth living creatures. Let us make man in our image. He is called the Logos in Greek. You've heard of Logia, the Loge, or the Logo. Like a logo that is the word or the stamp or the identifying symbol of a corporation or a logo which can be like a drop head to an article. Well, it merely means spokesman. And so in the first chapter of the book of John, when it said in the beginning was the Word, capital letter W, and the Word was with God and the Word was God, the Logos was Theos, meaning he was part of the divine Elohim. Now that is a family term, more than one. I am Armstrong. My father was Herbert W. Armstrong. He was an Armstrong. I'm an Armstrong. When I was born, they didn't build a little hut out there and put me on a chain, leave me outside. They let me come into the house, and I was part of the family. Almighty God has produced according to His own kind. He has created after His kind. And creation was not completed in the Garden of Eden. It was only begun. We're merely a human physical prototype of what Almighty God is doing here below. Now, I want to come back when I take a quick break and come back into the Scripture and show you that God Himself through the words of Jesus Christ and the writings of the Apostle Paul, specifically says that God is a person. Take a look at this. Be sure to write for it a call. Call right away while the lines are available, and we have plenty of people waiting to take your call. And I'll be right back. Is God a mystery? Is it required that you accept the doctrine of the Trinity in order to be saved? 
A careful reading of the Athanasian Creed contained in the Catholic Encyclopedia is an exercise in confusion. What about the Holy Spirit? The Bible likens it to a mighty rushing wind and the element of fire. But is the Holy Spirit a third person? Part of an unfathomable Godhead in which there are no individuals? Clear up the confusion when you read your free copy of Is God a Mystery? You'll also receive the sermon tape, Must You Believe in the Trinity to be Saved? They're yours free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. After the program is over, if you don't have time right now or you didn't have time during the break, go get your own Bible and open it up. Please look into Hebrews, the first chapter, and just read it slowly, word by word. Understand every word. Read two words, then three words. Understand all three words. Go back and read them again. Read it like you would any other book, a newspaper, a journal, uh, a trade publication, uh, a handbook, an instructional pamphlet, whatever. Don't get spooky. Don't try to make it mean something it doesn't mean or say something it doesn't say. Let's do it together for a minute. Just look at what is here. There's a treasure house of knowledge in the first few verses of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews about God. God is trying to reveal himself to you. He's trying to tell you about him, who he is, what he is, where he is, of what is he composed, what is his program, what is in his mind, what is he trying to do here below. What are we? Are we his creatures or are we the end result of lovesick amoeba? Did we come from a chance strike of uh, lightning in a soup of methane and ammonia in the primordial wilderness or swamps that were supposed to be on this earth at that time, long prior apparently to the dinosaurs? Who knows? Well, evolution is not the answer, and evolution can be absolutely disproved and proved to be one of the most idiotic assumptions you've ever heard by simple logic, not only by the seven proofs that I've presented over the decades of my ministry, but by the proofs of thousands of them that are available in the physical sciences, all the way from gravity itself to the cleavage properties of minerals to reproduction to all of the very, there is microevolution, that is almost endless variety within a species, but macroevolution is impossible. Horses don't become cows, cows don't become humans, humans don't become elephants. They all are true to kind. Now having said that, let's go back to Hebrews, the first chapter, and it says that he is in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, the ages. And there again, it absolutely is the same as the first chapter of the book of John, that Christ, the Logos, the Son, was the creating agent. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the Son was the brightness of the glory of God. He was a wonderful example. He was a perfect manifestation. The Father was glorified and made greater by the glory of and the perfection of the Son. And the express image of His person, shall I repeat that? I was told, and people were writing, and a lot of, tens of thousands of people were told, in the last few years, where a major, well, major, it would have been one of the smaller ones, according to the way people uh, talk about the numbers in major churches, as far as mainstream fundamentalism is concerned, I suppose. But nevertheless, major, when it's well over 100,000 people all at once, are told they used to believe that God was a person, but now he's not a person anymore. That sort of blows your mind. I, I just can't believe that someone would sit around there and say, what do I believe today? Tell me what I believe, what's coming down from on high, without a voice in it, without deciding what they believe by their own sovereign decision to look into the Word of God and have the ethical and the moral strength and courage to make up their minds as to what they decide to believe, instead of having it poured into their head through a funnel by some fellow that tells you this is what you ought to believe. I believe this word here. This is exactly what I believe, that he upholding all things by the word of his power, he had that power to uphold all things. He has said to the oceans, you shall go thus far and no farther. He put the earth exactly the distance from the sun. He put the moon exactly the correct distance from the earth as it makes its annual journey around the sun to take care of the tides and the ocean currents like the Japanese current, the Humboldt current, and all of the currents of the oceans that affect our weather and even affect migratory patterns of birds, fish, and even affect man to some extent. Upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, that's Christ, purged our sins, 
because that one life was worth more than all of human life put together because he is the creator of human life. So that one creator life, now very God in human form, came to this earth, was born of the Virgin Mary, grew up as a human, and his life was sacrificed for the sins of the world when he had by himself purged our sins. And there's a very, very great deal said there that needs an entire sermon by itself because when Jesus Christ died on the stake, at the last moments, he was left alone and he didn't see it coming. He didn't expect it. I preached a number of sermons on that, but one in particular many years ago where I talked about the greatest secret that was never told and that it was kept until the last moment, which explains why Jesus Christ cried out, my God, why hast thou forsaken me as the last moment before he died? So as I say, there's a lot in that. Now, it says when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels did he say at any time, you are my son. Isn't that plain? It's a father talking to a son. Unto which of the angels did he ever say, you, an angel, a created spirit being, a servant of God, to help effect the plan and the purpose of God, to work as God's messengers, to carry out God's mission and his his programs and his purposes on this earth to intervene where they need to do to protect someone, save someone from an accident, perhaps rebuke Satan or his demons. So it says, unto which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, he's quoting from the Old Testament, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Do you hear three people there? Is there, is there some other third person involved? Are there three people involved in the procreation of humankind or only two? Look at the universe, look at the earth, look at the solar system, and look at the laws. How many poles are there? Two, opposite. Positive, negative, right? How many sexes are there? Two. How many nostrils? Two. How many eyes? Two. How many ears? Two. Hands? Two. Legs? Two. Arms? Two. Feet? Two. Throughout God's creation, because man is made in the image of God, you will see duality. There is the first man, Adam, and the second man, Adam, spoken of by metaphor in the first Corinthians, the 15th chapter, which is the resurrection chapter. Adam being Adam and Christ being by metaphor, the second man, Adam. The first was from the earth, earthy. The second was the Lord from heaven. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament, not three of them. There was the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, not three of them. Moses and Aaron, two. When you find that God worked through some of the prophets, you will see pair. Jesus sent out the disciples by pairs, two by two. There was Elijah and Elisha. There was Moses and Aaron. And you see this throughout the Word of God and the plan of God. Now, coming back to Hebrews, the first chapter, it says again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, verse 6, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. The begettal takes place from God the Father who puts His Holy Spirit inside the converted human being who goes through the baptismal rite and receives God's Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. What is spirit? You can't see, taste, or smell, or hear spirit. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And the Greek word ganao, G-E-N-N-A-O, involves the entire process of begettal, gradual development from the zygote to the fetus to the partrician process or birth, and is not just the moment of conception, but is also the moment of partrician, or is the entire process in the Greek word is implied there in the word ganao. And so you see the way you got into the world and the way your children got here, and you see the very same pattern that God is using in the spiritual creation in recreating according to the God kind. And God is called our Father. Jesus said this, when you pray, you can almost insert, but I won't. I'll just go ahead and complete that and then come back and discuss it after I take a break. When you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. 
Doesn't say you pray to the, to the Virgin Mary. Doesn't say you pray to a saint somewhere. Doesn't say you pray to a long lost relative. You don't pray to the stream or the spirit of the tree. You don't pray to a rock. You don't pray to the sun. You don't pray to a little, you don't stick a prayer wheel in the stream and let that do it for you. You don't put tinkling bells out and when the wind blows, those are my prayers going up. You don't light a dumb joss stick. You don't think that burning wax is sending up prayers. You just get on your knees in a place. You go to a private place, what Jesus Christ said to do. I know most people don't pay attention to what he said, but I think you should. And he said, say, our Father, which art in heaven. And that's what unlocks his attention. That's what gets his attention, not making funny signs with your hand. Well, take a look at this. I'll be right back. Is God a mystery? Is it required that you accept the doctrine of the Trinity in order to be saved? A careful reading of the Athanasian Creed contained in the Catholic Encyclopedia is an exercise in confusion. What about the Holy Spirit? The Bible likens it to a mighty rushing wind and the element of fire. But is the Holy Spirit a third person, part of an unfathomable Godhead in which there are no individuals? Clear up the confusion when you read your free copy of Is God a Mystery? You'll also receive the sermon tape, Must You Believe in the Trinity to be Saved? They're yours free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. Why would we suppose that people long ago, about 325 A.D., at the Council of Nicaea, came, coming up with an idea in the Greek word that God is some kind of an hypostasis, know more about it than you can know today when you've got the same documents in front of you? Look at Hebrews, the second chapter, for an example, in verse 9. I've only got a couple of minutes, so I've got to really hurry here. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, because he was the creator and the agent of that creation, in bringing many, listen, many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation, that's Christ, who is the first fruits from the dead, perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all of one, of one Father is the implication, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, quoting from the Old Testament, I will put my trust in him. And again, another quote, quote, Behold, I and the children which God has given me. End quote. Any seventh grader can understand it. So can you. Somebody else doesn't need to tell you what you believe. You need to decide what you believe, and you need to research it. This is the handbook from God. It's not a church document. It's the Bible. Be sure to get this material. You're going to be awfully glad you did. It'll clear up an awful lot of cobwebs in, in an awful lot of minds, a lot of dark corners a lot of people don't understand. Is God a mystery? Should He be? And must you accept the doctrine of the Trinity in order to be saved, receive salvation? Do you have to accept the idea that God is an hypostasis and He is not really a person? Well, these scriptures I've been going through with you prove otherwise, don't they? to any person of an open mind. Be sure to get the material. Dial right now, 903-561-7070. That's 903-561-7070. You can write to me, Garner Ted Armstrong, Box 1117, Tyler, Texas, 75710. Once more, 903-561-7070. And I'll see you right here, same time, in one week. As you can see, the work of Garner Ted Armstrong goes on. You may contact our offices at 903-561-7070. And thank you for your interest.